So um, I was been told to keep this as quick as I possibly can. So uh, my name is Cody Osterman. I'll be talking about uh, virtual volume support uh, on the flash array. I'm the technical director here at Pure Storage uh, for VMware Solutions. So we uh, support VVOLs. Any questions? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not, absolutely not. So we'll, we'll go, <laughs> all right, we're done, all right, so. Uh, all right, so let's, let's get into a little bit of details here, um, and I'll do a quick demo. Um, I had to use Pete's Viva La Viva thing. Just wanna quickly talk about what virtual volumes is, or I'm gonna stay over there. A um, little bit about our boss provider, like you asked. Uh, quickly about storage policy-based management, but most of this is gonna be a demo, to show you how it works. There's really a major focus for here, uh, us at Pure on our VVOL implementation was to make it very simple to set up, right? Uh, a lot of the customers I spoke with the past, well, I don't know, 35 years about VVOLs was they had a really tremendous, tremendously difficult time getting up and running originally, right? And this is really what was slow down, slowing down VVOL's adoption. There are a variety of other reasons, but a lot of it was complexity. And so from a, a flash rate perspective, we really strive to make this as simple as possible. The VOS provider, storage containers, protocol endpoints, all that stuff. If it, it wasn't needed to be touched or configured, we removed it or automated it in some way. So let's get into the details. So you're, probably a lot of you are very familiar with the challenge with the MFS, right? Say you have some VMs, they have virtual disks, those virtual disks are files, and that's on a volume, right? And when you want to go configure that VM, you want to replicate that virtual machine, if you want a snapshot, if you want to restore it, right, what do you have to do? Well, if you want to replicate it, I mean, you can use host-based replication, but let's say you have your array-based replication. How do I do that? Well, I can replicate this whole data store, this whole volume, this LUN, or I can move that VM to a LUN that is replicated. Right? And that works today okay with you know, plugins and oh yeah, I know this is replicated every 30 seconds or every five minutes, but what about day two? How do I know it's still replicated tomorrow and the next day and the next month? Right? And this is what VVOLS solves, not just the granularity issue, right? Every virtual disk is now a volume on the array, but it also is policy-based, not just for policy prov provisioning on day zero, but policy to make sure it's provisioned and configured properly for the lifetime of that virtual machine. Right. Otherwise, in order to control that and, and manage that, you need additional software, and that kind of gets even more complex. So, this is you know the overall view. I'm sure you've all seen this slide before if you've talked about VVOLs. There's a couple different parts of this. Of course, I purified it a little bit. We have our management plane, we have our physical data plane, and then we have our storage policy-based management. All right. So there's three main parts of this. And I'll go into detail on, or a little bit of detail on each one of these parts. And also, I'll be putting out a blog on like Wednesday that's super detailed. They told me it was too long, but it's all gonna be in there. So a lot more information, and then we'll also be presenting on it this week. So, first off, what is a VVOL? When you create a VVOL-based virtual machine, it creates, well, at least two VVOLs, right? You have your config VVOL, four gigs in size. This holds configuration information, right? Your VMX, logs, a few things like that. Swap VVOL, when you power it on, Creates a swap file, swap volume. When you power it off, it automatically deletes it. And then, of course, the all important data VVOL. Right? Every virtual disk you add on a VVOL data store right, is going to be a data VVOL, a volume on the array. And this is what you can replicate and restore and so forth. And this gives you the granularity, but that's just part of it. Another benefit here right, is um, now when you take a VMware based snapshot, it's going to create an array based snapshot. Right, that creates that array-based snapshot for that virtual disk. And so this allows you to do granular restores, granular copies. I want to restore another virtual disk from a source snapshot of this one. Right? It's just a standard array-based copy. It can happen very quickly. And also it removes that performance impact of standard VMFS VMware snapshots. Right? The copy on write, the delta file they have today. And so this is a major benefit of not only the VMware admins being able to create and manage array-based snapshots, but also the storage admin can still do it as well if they need to do individual restore. So the data plane, protocol endpoints. When VVOLs are created, they get bound as a sub LUN to that protocol endpoint. Okay. Uh, and this is, gets around the SCSI limitations of ESX, right? 256 devices in 6.0, double that in, in um, 6.5, but this is still a problem. So protocol endpoints become this mount point, so you can see up to, I think, 16,383 because they support flat LUN addressing, right, for protocol endpoints. You can have a lot of VVOLs bound to a single protocol endpoint. And the question is, do I need more than one protocol endpoint? Well, it comes down to your array, right? On the flash array, you really only need one um, for the entire array. We don't have a per device queue depth limit on a single volume, so that's not a really performance bottleneck. VMware changed their queuing mechanisms as well inside of ESX, so it's also not a bottleneck. 
if you want to create more than one on the flash drive, sure, that's fine. Um, but really one's all it needed. And we do automatically create that when you upgrade to the purity that supports VVOLs. So, back to your question about the VOS provider. Oops. VOS version three, so this is the version that includes replication, this is what we support. Uh, there will be a redundant service on both controllers. Right, VASA active active on both controllers. And there is no VASA database, so there's no need to back up or restore it. There is no database in the controllers. It is stateless as far as the controllers see. So if you were to lose both your controllers and you replace them with even a completely different model of flash drive controllers, booted it back up, it pulls in all that metadata from the SSDs, from the underlying storage. It's all configured with the metadata of the volumes, bindings, sizes, VVOL ID, that's all that stuff is in the flash array storage. So the only way you lose your VASA database is if you literally lose your entire array. Right? So there's no need to d develop your own fault tolerance, high availability, this is all done by the standard mechanisms inside of the flash array controllers. Right? And these get automatically installed and configured as soon as you upgrade, um, upgrade to the VVOL su uh, supported version of Purity. Okay. Policy-based management, we have a variety of different policies. A lot of this is on the flash array. There's not a lot of things to configure or choose. Right, RAID or tiers. It's really about snapshot protection, right? Um, how often do I want to take a local snapshot via policy? How long do I want those snapshots retended for? Array-based replication, same idea. How often do I want it to be replicated? How long do I want that to be retended for? What concurrency of replication do I want? Do I want this VVOL to be on an array that has QoS enabled? Right, those are the capabilities that we have built into it. And uh, another nice thing about the flash array and our view jumped just right over QoS. QoS, yes. Uh, yeah, so the initial version of our QoS, that's a good question, um, is it's enabled array-wide, right? So it's a noisy neighbor kind of concept, right? If it's enabled on the array, we'll throttle certain guys. Exactly. The next version of our QoS will be more focused on individual. Yep, absolutely. Yes, I, I, always. I think that's the point of this whole thing, isn't it? A little bit of teasing. Let's see, uh, active cluster synchronous replication flow through of evolves. So the question is, is Active Cluster and Synchronous Rep going to be support VVOLs, not at GA? Are there concurrent projects? And it's the VVOL support for Synchronous Replication is going to come after original GA for VVOLs. Uh, the same time, so that's going to be Q3-ish, something like that. So this will be around. I told the engineering, I am not demoing a beta version of VVOLs at another VM world ever, ever again in my life. So we'll just, just we'll take that, right? Um, all right. So. The last point I want to make before I go into a quick demo is um, are VVOL special volumes? A, a common problem I, that customers bring to me when they're talking about VVOLs is VMFS is already a proprietary file system. This is already the amount of vendor lock-in I have, right? I mean, you can get out of it. There's conversions and things like that. But moving to a proprietary architecture is even a worse problem, right? And that's not the case. VVOLs is a, is a T10 standard, right? Everything, the communication of the storage is all based on T10 standards. Yes, there's some VASA stuff in it. But the volumes themselves, especially on the flash array, and other vendors might have this slightly differently, but on the flash array, a VVOL is a volume. It is no different. The only way it is different to a host is how it's addressed. A VVOL is addressed via sub LUN. A regular volume is addressed via just a LUN ID. So you could have an RDM and then attach it as a sub LUN, now it's a VVOL on the flash array. You could have a physical server that has a regular volume presented to it, and at the same time have that same volume presented to a VM as a VVOL on the flash array. There's no difference how that volume is addressed and seen and managed by the flash array. We have some, we have some beta testers. Of course, if, if there's clustering or something like that. But a nice benefit we have a customer doing in our beta right now is that they have a physical Oracle server. They take an array, ba a v, uh, I'm sorry, array based snapshot of that volume, and they're actually presenting that to their VM for dev test to run their dev test workloads against. On the, on the flash array, it's a volume of evolves. It's all the same, right? Just how it's addressed by that host is what makes it different. And this makes. VVOL is easy to get in and out, right? VMware to Hyper-V to whatever, right? The flash array currently supports 5,000 volumes and 50,000 snapshots. We are aggressively looking at upping that number uh, as well. 5,000 VVOLs and 50,000 snapshots, yep. Um, so that number will be going up in the f near future. About 1,000 VMs, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, let's um, so quickly, let's just actually go straight into the demo at this point. One of the first things we want to make sure here is that the setup of VVOLs is very easy. Right, right now I have my flash array. I have really nothing configured on it. Um, I have a host group with two VMFS volumes configured. That's about it. Um, and in vCenter, I don't have my VOS provider registered. So let's go through that whole process, then provision a VM. 
So in our Pure Storage plugin, uh, we've added the ability to register your VASA providers. Right? I'll right click on my array, register storage provider, give it my credentials, and register. What this is going to do is register both of the VAS providers on both of my controllers for that array within vCenter. So we go back home to my hosting clusters, and we'll see that both of my VAS providers, if I move to the array, have been registered. Now the next step is provisioning my protocol endpoint, mounting a storage container. Well, you can manually do that if you want. The protocol endpoint is automatically created on the flash array when you upgrade. Um, or um, you can right click on the cluster here, use our plugin once again, create data store, choose VVOL, give it a size. Uh, it also comes with a default storage container that defaults to 64 terabytes, but that's configurable. Uh, we'll do flash array, array dash SC1 and I'll mount it to that cluster. And so that's what this is going to do is look, is that protocol endpoint seen by this cluster? If no, provision it to the host group that represents that cluster, rescan it, and then mount my storage container on both of the hosts inside of that cluster. So if we take a look here, my storage container has been mounted and the protocol endpoint's ready to go. So the next step here real quickly is uh, put a VM on it. We'll call it Cody VM. And we'll choose one of my hosts. And then we'll, um, we want to choose a policy. But I don't have any policies. So what do we do? Well, we also added another feature inside of our plugin to help you create policies automatically. Once again, of course, you can manually create policies. Um, go in there and use you know, our local, local snapshot interval, remote replication, whatever. Um, or you can auto-create them based on our protection groups. And you've heard protection groups a couple times now. Uh, and they're essentially re local snapshot policies, replication policies um, that you can put your volumes into, you know, restore and protect a consistency group, essentially. So I go back into my pure storage plugin, and I hit import protection groups. This will pull in all of my protection groups from that array and all of their, their configuration, how often they have local snapshot policies, if they have it, how what the replication policies look like, uh, inter uh, intervals for... Um, retention and so forth. All right, so go ahead and import them, and that's going to create storage policies inside of vCenter based on my protection groups. If I go back to my storage policies, and real quickly we can see we have my storage policies that have been created, and it'll be auto-populated with those capabilities. And you can go edit them, of course, if you want to. So we go back to our VM provisioning here, and we've got to go back. Might need to restart the provisioning wizard. Yeah, I need to restart the wizard. So go reprovision a VM, and we'll use one of these policies, and it'll be configured according to that policy. So let's go new, new VM from this template, uh, test VM, choose a host, choose one of my policies. We'll do this one here. So tell me if I have any VVOL data stores available. I do. Um, I have one protection group that meets the policy that I just chose um, that's on this array. If I have multiple ones, of course, multiple can be chosen. I'll choose my bronze one. And we'll go ahead and finish. So on the flash array, it's going to create those volumes. Also, what it's going to do, if we go into our volumes tab here, it's going to create what we call a volume group. A volume group is basically our representation of a virtual machine on the array. All right, so all your, your config vvol, your data vvol, whatever your swap VVOL, any other VVOLs will be added to this volume group. So you can then report, like in our analysis tab, you can report on VMs, which is a volume group, right, on capacity, data reduction, or you can, of course, report on individual volumes, right, capacity, performance, and so forth. We really didn't want to create custom objects like a VM on the array that someone else couldn't use. This is one of the reasons we use volume groups, because then automatically it's created by our VOS provider, and you can report as the name for your VMs, we can also manually create them as well if you want to report on something else, right? That's not in VVOLs. So go ahead and uh, last minute here of this demo. I'll go ahead and power it on. Show you some new features we're also doing with our plugin. So go ahead and power it on. That'll quick create the swap, VVOL, so forth. Uh, edit settings, and I'm going to add a new virtual disk. And this will be kind of the last thing I'll show you here. So I'll add just one basic virtual disk, default. 
add, and okay. So that'll create a new volume on the flash array. But let's say I wanted to go and present that to another VM, because I have a database on it or something like that. And I go into the, the VM itself, edit settings, and I went to remove it, but I accidentally click delete. All right, so I hit X, delete, okay, oops, it's gone, right? In this case, I'd have to go to my backup provider to restore it and bring it back from a snapshot or something like that. But since it's a volume, right, on the flash array, we have a 24-hour recycling bin, right, where your volumes will go into. And we'll see that my deleted volume is actually in my deleted or destroyed volumes folder. And I have 24 hours to recover it. I could manually do that. Or on my new tab here for my VM, it's based on VVOLs, I could do restore deleted disk. This will look in my destroyed volumes folder. I can click on that destroyed volume and then restore it, right? And that's gonna bring it back to the VM, present it as a, new, as a virtual disk, right where it was before, right? Um, we also have some tasks to import virtual disks. So if you have managed or unmanaged snapshots and you wanna bring them between VMs, we can pull and move our VMs, our virtual disks, our VVOLs, and their snapshots between other, other VMs, right, right from in our plugin. Yeah. What um, controls do I have on, as from a storage administrator on the ability to, of FASA to restrict it, say, to the numbers of VMs it creates, frequency it creates? Because you just showed there that keeping the, the volume in a folder, that yeah. could be used for something else, you know, to recover it another time. If I've got somebody who's actively creating and destroying hundreds of VMs on a particular day, yeah. they could overwhelm the amount of storage. Yeah, so the question was, what's, what are the restrictions on what a um, storage admin can put on the VMware admin? Um, once they've given the VOS provider, they have pretty much the ability to create within the storage container, right? So the storage container can be sized to, I don't know, one terabyte, 10 terabytes. As soon as they fill that up, then they can't provision anymore, right? Unless they delete something or delete some virtual disks or something like that. From within that storage container, they can go and do what they want to do. Um, and really, I mean, frankly, the end game for all this really shouldn't be using vCenter. It should be using something like vRealize Automation, right? There's a storage policy-based plugin. There's some great ways of provisioning VMs and managing infrastructure. And it really allows you to build exactly the role-based access control allocation limits that you want, right? Uh, and using that with vVols is really where customers should be moving. vCenter is really an engine. It really shouldn't be the end, end user interface these days, right? And I think that's where things are going. All right, so that's what I quickly want to show you. So we're coming out with it pretty soon. Um, and all the longer session go into more detail on kind of how it works and the inner, um, inner, inner workings of it all. But other than that, uh, if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer it. Otherwise, we'll call it a day.